Um, do the late arrivals have any questions about the last <laughs> lecture? Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, this lecture, um, we will uh, develop the Feynman rules for a um, theory involving fermions. Our principal problems, as I stated at the end of last lecture, will be uh, to keep track of all the indices that are carried by the various Fermi fields. Uh, after all, if we consider any of the, either of the two models I wrote down in the previous lecture as generalizations of our scalar meson nucleon theory, in the scalar theory we had only three fields to worry about, phi, psi, and psi star. We now have nine, four components for psi and four for psi star, so we'll have more combinatorics to juggle, and uh, to worry about the minus signs due to the Fermi statistics. However, if we keep our wits about us and avoid falling asleep, we should be able to straighten out both of those things. As always, uh, things begin by, we begin by computing the propagator. In the sort of theories we're thinking about, there are meson fields whose propagator is unaltered by the free propagator is unaltered by the presence of Fermi fields in the theory. It's the Fermi field propagator we have to compute, the contraction function, I should say. So, we want to compute the function psi of x psi bar of y equals time-ordered product psi of x psi bar of y minus normal-ordered product psi of x psi bar of y. <coughs> um, two remarks, uh, well actually three remarks need to be made. First, uh, f the first is that by reasoning parallel to that in the uh, scalar case, this can readily be seen to be a C number. The difference between the two orderings is just an anti-commutator, which is always a C number, because of the minus signs we've inserted in our definitions. Secondly, in order to keep from cluttering the board with indices, I will adopt the same convention um, I adopted when discussing the commutator. Whatever the order of the operators, the order of the indices will be in this expression will be such that the psi bar index is always on the right. So we don't get a silly expression that is a, um, a uh, four by four matrix for one ordering and a one by one matrix for another ordering. The, um, secondly, because both the time-ordered product and the normal-ordered product are uh, anti-symmetric in interchange of the two operators, that's how we've defined them, psi of x psi bar of y equals minus psi bar of y psi of x. Exchanging the two operators gives us a minus sign. That's statistics. Now, unless there are any questions about this notational convention and the consequence of the minus signs we've introduced into the definition of both the time order product and the normal order product, are there such questions? I will proceed with the computation. We have to write down, yet once again, the expression for the fee, fee field. The usual kinematic factors, a nucleon annihilation operator bearing its appropriate spinner, and an anti-nucleon creation operator bearing its appropriate Dirac by spinner and the usual space time factor. And of course, the psi bar of y is almost the same thing, except that the operators are adjoined. The spinners 
are barred, and x is replaced by y. Of course, p0 is ep, as always in such expressions. <coughs> now, it's fairly easy to construct. Have I made a mistake? I hear mumbling. I write you one. Um, yes. Thank you. Psi of x, psi bar of y, is of course equal to the vacuum expectation value, free vacuum, psi of x, psi bar of y. We will compute this, firstly for x naught greater than y naught, secondly for x naught less than y naught, and then stick the two things together. For x naught greater than y naught, the psi bar is on the right, where only the creation part, the p particle creation part, is relevant. The uh, psi is on the left, where only the annihilation part is relevant. So I simply obtain a single integral, dq p, 2 pi cubed, 2 e sub p, e to the minus i p, dot x minus y, and the spinner sum. Is there any question about where this formula came from? The spinner sum is, of course, something we have a wonderful identity for. It is p slash plus m. And therefore, I could write this whole expression as i d slash x plus m. I put an x on here to let you know I'm differentiating with respect to x and not y. Integral d cubed p 2 pi cubed the 2 e sub p e to the minus i p dot x minus y. This integral is, of course, the same integral we encountered in doing the scalar case. If we considered a scalar field, not the scalar field that's going to be coupled with, um, with the uh, Fermi field in this theory, but a hypothetical free scalar field of mass m, then this is simply i d slash x plus m phi of x phi of y. I now turn to the case y naught greater than x naught. Um, in this case, the order of the operators is reversed. Of course, the order of the matrix indices is not reversed. What is the change? Well, there's an overall minus sign because the definition of the time-ordered product for Fermi fields has a minus sign in it. Otherwise, the integral is exactly the same, dqp. 2 pi cubed, 2 e sub p, x and y now have the creation and annihilation parts change places. So I get that. And I get the sum on R vrp p. I pick up the v's. This sum is, of course, by famous identity, p slash minus m. And thus, this whole thing can be written as d slash x minus m. Hmm? Minus 
Um, all right. Because the X has now got the plus IP on it. I times I is minus 1 minus M times, uh, whoops. What did I do wrong? Did I do something wrong? Plus M. Yeah. <laughs> yes, yes, that's a good thing because it's the same thing in both cases. So we can short circuit the whole computation. We don't have to do that terrible thing you did on homework problem number two, as I recall, of writing things in terms of contour integrals and closing the contours. Since we have established that for both regions, which between them cover all space, time, <coughs> uh, psi of x, psi bar of y equals i d slash x plus m uh, phi of x phi of y without restriction. And uh, therefore, we can immediately write the Fourier transform expression. This is uh, integral d4p over 2 pi to the fourth i over p squared minus m squared plus i epsilon e to the minus ip <coughs> dot x minus y. And now the effect of putting the d slash x and the m is to put p slash plus m in the numerator. Yes, sir? Uh, two small points in computation. Can you repeat again how come um, you get v's when y is greater than x zero and u's in other case? Yeah, because in uh, one case, the psi bar is on the right in the time ordered product. And um, therefore, um, uh, I only get the creation part of psi bar, which has a u in it. OK? This part of psi bar, which is the only thing that would tell me there's a v in this theory, is just annihilates the vacuum. When it's in the other order. Okay. And also, um, do you do an integration by parts, or is that? That's straight differentiation. Okay. P slash minus m? How does that get pulled out of the Well, I take the, here or here? Yeah. P slash minus m. Oh, uh, well, it's an identity. If I take this exp the expression without the P slash minus m and differentiate it with respect to x, which is a parameter in the integral, I get IP. Should there be a contraction? Yes, there should be a contraction. This is a product of two operators, not a number. <clears throat> Thus, we have discovered the analog of p squared 1 over i over p squared minus m squared for a um, boson field. It is um, for a, a scalar field. It's more complicated when we'll get to spin one boson. Uh, the analogous expression is i over p, sli of p slash plus m over p squared minus m squared plus i epsilon. One way of understanding this expression is to say that um, we are dealing with a four component field, all right. But after all, it only has uh, twice as many physical degrees of freedom as a charged boson field. It has got four components, but there are only two spin states for the particle and two for the antiparticle. So we couldn't expect to have the 4 by 4 identity matrix or anything like that appearing in the numerator. There are only two kinds of particles we can really exchange. So we should have some kind of projection operator for the exchange of those particles, at least as p squared moves to m squared and we really pick up the one particle states. And we've got the projection operator on the positive frequency states up there. Another way of understanding it to write this in an alternative form, which you'll frequently find in the literature. Since the only function of the i epsilon is to tell us how to control the pull, we can put a plus i epsilon in the numerator with no loss of generality. We can write the denominator
This would give us m plus i epsilon squared here, but m plus i epsilon squared, since m is a positive, m minus i epsilon squared, excuse me. But since m minus i epsilon squared is a positive number, since m is a positive number, m minus i epsilon squared puts the pole in the same place m squared minus i epsilon does. Ew, what an awful sentence. You know what I mean. <laughs> And then we can cancel this factor against this factor and obtain simply i over p slash minus m plus i epsilon. This makes the Feynman propagator for, this ver for the Dirac theory look very closely parallel to the Feynman propagator for a scalar theory. In a scalar theory, the free Klein-Gordon equation in momentum space involves the operator p squared minus m squared. The Feynman propagator is i over this operator, with the pole difficulty resolved by giving the mass a small imaginary part. In the Dirac equation, the, um, uh, the uh, Dirac equation in momentum space involves the operator p slash minus m. The Feynman propagator is 1 over this uh, i over this object with the pole ambiguity resolved by giving the mass a small imaginary part. We shall see later on, if I talk about uh, quantization through functional integration, that the propagator is always, in this sense, the inverse of the uh, quadratic differential form that appears in the free Lagrangian. <laughs> <coughs> However, are there uh, any questions about the computations or the words I've said? Just another question-free lecture. I may again be stuck with um, ex ex extra time. Yes, it's all humbug. For Christmas, you're going to get a gigantic problem set. <laughs> 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 uh, yes, sir? Uh, what meaning are we to attach to 1 over a matrix? Are oh, the inverse of the matrix. The, um, I mean, uh, there's no, uh, there was no illegitimacy in any of these operations. These two matrices commute with each other. Oh, actually, there was something administrative I wanted to ask you before I began the uh, lecture, and I forgot. You can turn off the TV camera for this. <laughs> the, uh, I uh, have to decide when to schedule the final. Action. <laughs> okay. the, uh, <clears throat> now, to derive, um, before writing down the general rules for the Feynman rules in uh, such a theory, it's probably best to see how things work out by doing a uh, particular uh, diagram and seeing just how all the various matrices fit together. The theory I will consider is that of a free Fermi field, a uh, free meson field, and an interaction between them, minus g psi bar gamma psi phi, where gamma is equal to either 1 or i gamma 5. In the one case, the field, the theory is parity invariant if the scalar field is declared to be scalar. In the other case, it is parity invariant if it is declared to be pseudoscalar. For what I uh, uh, am going to do at the moment, what that 4 by 4 matrix gamma is will be irrelevant. <coughs> Let's consider a typical scattering process. For example, nucleon plus meson goes into nucleon plus meson. The, uh, one of the several Feynman diagrams, one of the two Feynman diagrams, the one I'll focus on just as an example, that contributes to this process to lowest order 
is uh, this one. The nucleon is characterized by having some momentum P, the meson momentum Q, P prime and Q prime for the outgoing momenta. And of course, the nucleon is in some spin state. We're constructing S matrix elements between states of definite spin. So I have to give an index R here and an index S here, where R S equals 1 or 2 telling me whether the nucleon is spinning up or spinning down. Otherwise, I will uh, use, uh, just as in the scalar case, uh, relativistically normalized states. So I don't have to keep track of the factors of 2 pi to the 3 halves and 1 over 2 e sub p. Those are automatically taken care of as, as part of the density of states in our rules for turning S matrix elements into cross sections. <coughs> this. Um, The uh, Feynman diagram, I remind you, is a descendant of a term in the Wick expansion, which is minus Ig squared over 2 factorial integral d4x1 integral d4x2 psi bar gamma psi phi, all at point 2. This stands for x2, not uh, the index. <laughs> Uh, psi bar 1, gamma, psi 1, phi 1, all at point 1, and with a contraction between psi and psi bar. Although I didn't say so explicitly, and I should slap my own hand for not saying so explicitly, of course, we are adopting the same diagrammatic conventions we adopted in the scalar model with the spinner nucleon field, charged nucleon field, replacing the scalar charged nucleon field before. <coughs> are there any questions about um, what this diagram means and where it came from? Yes, sir. Oh, this is a question that should have been asked two months ago, but I will I'd be happy to answer it now. Uh, no, oh, well, the exponential of the disconnected diagrams is not particularly useful in this case because this is a of the connected diagrams, because this is a connected diagram and a normal order, which I forgot to write down. Excuse me. This is a connected diagram, and it has two annihilation operators in it and two creation operators. And when I exponentiate it, I get successive terms in the exponential with four annihilation operators and four creation operators, etc. Normal order terms with four annihilation operators and four creation operators will not contribute to two into two scattering. They will contribute to two into four, to four into four scattering. And indeed, we would get this diagram doubled for four into four scattering. Okay. The exponentiation formula is, has its uses. It's useful if you're studying vacuum to vacuum. If this has no creation and no annihilation operators, it contributes no matter how many times you exponentiate it. And it's useful for studying generating functionals because there again, you're just looking for vacuum to vacuum, the external objects, the external particles having being replaced by source functions. But um, in, uh, in actually computing an S matrix element, unless it's a very complicated one, like scattering inside a scattering of a particle by a laser beam or something like that, the exponentiation formula is not particularly useful. OK, is that now clear? Okay. <clears throat> now, let's write down the final state Initial state S matrix element coming from this contribution from this term in the Wick expansion. The minus IG squared survives just as in the scalar theory. I should write S minus 1. Well, since I'm only writing the contribution of a single diagram, but it's just as well written the contribution of that single diagram to S. The uh, minus IG squared survives. Just as in the scalar theory, the two factorial is canceled by the fact that we have can either call this 1 and this 2, or vice versa. We then get 
the integral d four x one d four x two and a bunch of exponential factors. What are these exponential factors? Phi 1 is annihilating a meson in the initial state. So I have e to the minus iq dot x1. Psi 1 is annihilating the initial nucleon. So I have e to the minus ip dot x1. Likewise, everything is being created at x2. So I have positive exponential factors for x2. Then I will have um, an integral over some momentum that occurs in the Fourier expansion of the uh, propagator. And that we'll call that k, although I called it p before if you, refer, if you use pay, uh, k for other purposes. And a p for other purposes, so I'll call it k now. Now we've got the actual matrices along the line. Let's call in the order in which this thing is set up from right to left. The annihilation of a, um, of a meson, of course, carries nothing with it. Annihilation of a nucleon, however, carries a factor of u, and the u in question is ur. That takes care of this thing. Then as we go along, there's a gamma. And then we've got the contraction, which is i over k slash minus m plus i epsilon. Then we've got phi 2, well, that's nothing. We can drag that around as we please. That commutes with everything inside the normal ordering product. A gamma again. And then <coughs> the, um, and this, of course, for momentum p. And this is for momentum p prime. <coughs> the, um, the x integrals are, of course, trivial. And in this case, the p integral is also trivial. They, as usual, give us a 2 pi to the fourth times an overall energy momentum conserving delta function, just as in the scalar case, uh, and replace uh, k by um, uh, p plus q. As we see here, oops, I'm sorry. You should have called me. I forgot e to the minus i k x1 minus x2. No, x2, no, x. It's very important. I remember what the final answer is, because that's the thing you use every day when you do this kind of thing. x2 minus x1. Very good. That's very important. Yes, that's right. The first minus the second. Uh, Thus, we see that p and q come in with a minus i sign for x1, and k comes in with a plus sign for x1. So k is set equal to p dot p plus q. And I get i u bar p prime s gamma i over p slash plus q slash minus m plus i epsilon gamma us of p. We have to be much more careful about whether k, the intermediate momentum, is set equal to p plus q or minus p plus q here, because unlike the scalar case, the propagator is not invariant under, under change of sign of p. Yes, it's r and s. Mm -hmm. um, help. And the and an ig minus ig squared. Okay, is that everything? No. Okay. What else have I left off? That's it. Okay, good. It's my 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 secret method of making sure you follow every tell step. <laughs> Okay, well, this is very much the sort of generalization you would expect 
even if you hadn't gone through the derivation for a diagram of this sort in this theory, when you have this four com these bunch of four component, these set of four fields moving along here, you have a bunch of four by four matrices. As you pass through a vertex or propagate something, you have matrix multiplication. You, of course, a matrix element is not a matrix, it is a number. So to make it a number, you need a row vector for the, a column vector for the initial particle and a row vector for the final particle. Now, before I write down what happens in general, let me draw a, um, Let me consider a second process exactly the same, and bar, well, not exactly the same, slightly different, which will display, however, the general features that occur with a single exception. Let me consider anti-nucleon uh, meson scattering. That is, again, I'll call the initial momentum P, R, Q, P prime, S, Q prime. There, we'll consider the parallel diagram, just the other diagram, in fact, crossed. <clears throat> P, RQ, Q prime, P prime, S. Now, there are certain changes. Many things here are the same. Um, the um, principal change is that uh, in this, when I read this diagram off from here, I thought of this as being the point one, and this as being the point two, because this is the vertex where the nucleon is annihilated, and therefore also where the meson is annihilated. This diagram comes from exactly the same term in the Wick expansion, except that now I use this factor to annihilate the initial antinucleon, and this factor to create the final antinucleon. So I think of this as two, one. Okay. Thus, the thing is much the same. There's, an, uh, there's a Fermi sign I'll take care of later. Let's not worry about the ordering of operators within the normal order product for the moment. The thing is much the same, except that, firstly, the order of matrix multiplication still goes from uh, still goes from 1 to 2 along the line. That's the way it is here. So at the right-hand side of the matrix, you have u bar s of p prime, the factor that is associated with the annihilation of an antinucleon. Remember a u, uh, sorry, not u, v. A u multiplies a, meso, a nucleon annihilation operator, whereupon a v bar, a psi bar, multiplies an antinucleon annihilation operator. Said it wrong, darn it. That's what's on the far left. V bar R F. Excuse me for a moment. Excuse me for a moment while I bat my head against the wall. <laughs> um, v bar R of P, the factor associated with the annihilation of the initial nucleon. Now again, we have a gamma. Now, what about the propagator? That's going to be minus p slash plus q slash minus m plus r epsilon because we've switched x1 and x2, and therefore we've changed k into minus k in the energy cons momentum conserving delta function. Then there's a gamma again, and then there is the final nucleon being, final antinucleon being created, which gives us this. <clears throat> Finally, there is a minus one coming from Fermi statistics. Because if I look at this expression, the field that I want to use to annihilate the um, uh, initial nucleon, which antinucleon, which is a psi bar field, is over on the right, over on the left where it shouldn't be. It's got to be over on the right. Therefore, in order to put things in the right position to annihilate the initial um, particle and create the final particle, I have to switch 
this psi 1 and psi bar 2. And that switching within a normal ordered product gives me a minus sign. Yes, sir. I'm sorry, that was not the most clear exposition of this diagram. Yes? Yes, and also an energy conserving delta function. Thank you. Now, from these two examples, they actually contain practically all the novel features we, will encou we encounter in the Fermi theory. And I can therefore write down the uh, Feynman rules for, a, uh, for our theories involving fermions. I will write down the rules in three sections. I'll first tell you what the factors are, what you stick in. And I'll tell you matrix multiplication. That is, I'll tell you a bunch of matrices, which is sort of useless until I tell you how to, mu how to multiply them. And then at the very end, I'll tell you the rules for the Fermi minuses. Okay. Firstly, the factors. The factors are pretty much the same as before. If I have an internal meson line carrying momentum Q, that momentum, internal momentum is going to be integrated over. So I'll get a factor like this. And I'll get an I over Q squared minus mu squared plus I epsilon. Just as in a Bose, a Bose theory. If I have an internal nucleon line carrying momentum P, that internal nucleon line is going to be integrated over, ultimately. And there is a Fermi propagator like this, where P slash P, it not, in this case, I don't have to tell you how Q is oriented, because Q squared is minus Q squared. In this case, I have to tell you how Q is oriented, uh, how P is oriented. And P is oriented along the arrow. If you happen to find it convenient in a particular graph to orient P another way, that's fine by me, but then it's one I over minus P slash minus M plus I epsilon. The every vertex, say it comes in in this configuration, Q and P coming in, P prime coming out, gives us minus I G gamma 2 pi to the fourth delta 4 of P plus Q minus P prime. Exactly the same as in the scalar theory, except that it's now a matrix. And this, this is a glitch, it's just gamma. Now, this doesn't take care of all the matrix factors because I still have to tell you there are some row vectors and column vectors associated with initial and final fermions. For every incoming fermion, incoming nucleon, I have a U. A U appropriate to the state in which that nucleon is. If it happens to be in one of our standard states, then it is that U R. If it's not, it's some linear combination of U's, but it's some solution of the free Dirac equation associated with the momentum of that nucleon. On the other hand, with every incoming antinucleon, I have associated not a V, but a V bar, as shown in this example, where this is the incoming particle. With every outgoing nucleon, I have associated a U bar. 
and with every outgoing antinucleon, I have associated a U. This is nothing less, nothing more than a reflection of, of sorry, a V. This is nothing less than the re a reflection of the fact, well, I said it two times before, but I see people looking puzzled, so I'll say it for a third time. Nothing less than a reflection of the fact that it is psi which annihilates nucleons, but psi bar which annihilates antinucleons. I will get to that. I will get to that. That's going to be in part two. Okay. Okay. Uh, the uh, multiplication rule. Now the multiplication rules. <clears throat> we have matrices associated with Fermi lines and of course with vertices in which Fermi lines come in. And the rule is multiply matrices along a Fermi line. With, in what order? Well, we saw the order in our previous examples with head of the arrow on the left. matter which way the Fermi line is going through the diagram. Whether it's going through this way, as in our first example, and then we have the initial state, then we multiply the matrix. This is the first matrix in the string. This is the last matrix in the string. Okay. Or if it's going through this way, as in our second example, and this is the first matrix in the string on the left, and this is the last matrix on the string. Or even if it's turning around like nucleon, anti-nucleon annihilation into two mesons. It's always true, this is the matrix on the left, this is the matrix on the right. Of course, this is the only thing that's consistent with associating a row vector with a, in, a column vector with an incoming nucleon and an outgoing anti-nucleon and a row vector with the other two choices. If I wrote it in any other way, you would obtain a nonsense expression which had a U bar on the right and a, v bar and a U on the left, which would be garbage. So this rule is, in effect, determined by this one and consistency. <coughs> yes, sir? The rule of matrix multiplication is that I've got a bunch of matrices, one for every propagator, one for every vertex, and four by one and one by four matrices for the initial and final particles, or two initial particles, or two final particles. And I multiply just straight along the Fermi line, a U, a gamma, a propagator, a gamma, a U bar. OK? A U, a gamma, a propagator, a gamma, and a V bar. Uh, we're going from right to left, of course. B -b -b yeah. U. <laughs> Sorry. U. You know, for, on the extreme right is a U, on the extreme left is a U bar, and everything else is in between. And the extreme right is a U, on the extreme left is a V bar, and everything else is in between. What, what puzzles you? That's the order in which things come out in Wick's theorem. Right? It's always psi bar 1. And the order of matrix multiplication, if we arrange the terms properly, is this. These are the successive Fermi lines. I've suppressed the phi's. This thing is either comp uh, comp uh, contributing a U or a V. This is a bunch of propagators. There are some gammas floating in between, which I forgot to write down. Oops, sorry. Not there. There. <laughs> There's some gammas in between. So they've got a U or a V, depending upon whether I have an initial nucleon or a final antinucleon. A gamma, a propagator, a gamma, a propagator, a gamma, and then a U bar or V bar. OK, the head of the arrow is always on the left. Is now you're not happy, is that? Now, this, there is one thing 
that this uh, rule does not take care of, and that is what happens if we have a completely closed Fermi loop, as we can have. example here. Well, I've almost got that written down on the board. Let me write it down afresh. Just having writing down the Fermi fields, that's psi bar 1, gamma psi 1, psi bar 2, gamma psi 2, psi bar 3, gamma psi 3, psi bar 4, gamma psi 4, and uh, that's the term in Wick's theorem that gives us a closed loop. Now it's obvious what happens. I can start anywhere, and I multiply indices, or I multiply matrices, gamma, propagator, gamma, propagator, gamma, propagator, and I have a final propagator, and I'm to sum up all the indices. Summing up all the indices with no indices left over is what is known as taking the trace of the combined matrix. So for closed loops, you simply take closed Fermi loops, take the trace with one exception, with one uh, additional remark, which I will get to shortly. It happens to come along with this. It is a Fermi minus sign rule. <laughs> OK, that's firstly very reasonable. You've just, uh, obviously, you can't have any leftover indices. And the only way you can have no leftover indices from a string of matrices is to take the trace. Obviously, on a closed loop, it doesn't matter where you start multiplying the matrices. and. Uh, that's the property known as the invariance of the trace under cyclic permutations of the factors. It doesn't matter where you start your multiplication, you still get the same trace. The one uh, extra statement that I should have made immediately, but I postponed for 45 seconds, so I could put it in among the minus sign rules, is that here, all of these fellows are around in this order. And of course, I can always arrange them in this order. How I arrange the interaction Hamiltonians inside the normal ordered product is irrelevant. They commute with each other. Uh, I have a psi with a psi bar. But here I have a contraction in the other order, the psi bar on the left and the psi on the right. And as I remarked at the very beginning of this lecture, that is minus the contraction in the usual order, the standard order. So our first minus sign rule is that's the minus sign rule for closed loops. Take the trace. In fact, I could have embedded that in the previous rule and said minus the trace for closed loops. We will later actually check this rule for consistency in a forthcoming lecture where I go through with some rapidity the computation of the new meson self-energy in this theory. And there, the Fermi minus sign factor will be very important for the closed nucleon loop that occurs because we will see that that is the only thing that guarantees that the imaginary part of the self-energy has the proper sign, the sign that is consistent with the spectral representation. So we'll have a check on that. Even if you don't believe it, you'll see that if it weren't there, we would have gotten an absolutely insane answer for the meson self-energy. <laughs> the uh, final minus sign rule is difficult to phrase simply. It, as we saw, we got a minus sign in nucleon mes and anti-nucleon meson scattering as compared with nucleon meson scattering because we had to switch around the operators. Now, it is possible to give a sequence of rules for the result of all that switching around of the operators in the general case, but it is awkward. 
because if you have an initial state that consists of 32 nucleons and 47 antinucleons, and an initial and a final state that consists of six nucleons and seven antinucleons, you've got to get all sorts of rules about what you mean by a six nucleon, seven antinucleon state, which are created first and which are created second, and in what order. Therefore, I will just give you a, make the simple statement that, as we see already from this string, which could be part of some graph with three meson lines coming off of a, of a single nucleon line running through the graph. The order of the, un, of the normal ordered operators always come out psi bar psi in that order, where the psi is associated with the tail of a line and the psi bar with the beginning of a line. Okay. That's the only fact you have to remember. You always have the operator, whether you're going to use it or create or annihilate, associated with the beginning of the line, followed by the operator associated with the end of the line. If there are 32 lines traversing the diagrams in different directions and making hairpin turns, it doesn't matter, because what order I put these strings of psi bar size in doesn't matter. Strings of psi bar size, pairs of psi bar size always commute with each other. So I can write things down that way. The rule, the mnemonic is psi bar psi. It always comes out psi bar psi associated with the head and the tail of a given line. And then you have to look and see if the annihilation operators and the creation operators are in the right places or if you have to switch them around, depending upon whatever convention you have adopted for the absolute phase of a 17 nucleon 42 antinucleon state. So. I'm sorry, this is long, but after all, we've got a lot of fields to take a keep track of. And, uh, but the rules are basically extremely simple. Our propagators are matrices because we have four fields propagating at once, so they're four by four matrices. You multiply the matrices as they propagate along. That's physically very plausible. You have uh, four vectors for initial and final states. That's also plausible. It's got to be there to turn these matrices into numbers. When you go around the closed loop, that's taking the matrix trace. That's plausible. You have the Fermi minus signs, which are not plausible, but which you just have to memorize. Minus one for every closed loop, psi bar psi. Psi bar psi is an easy thing to remember. <laughs> are there any questions? Yes? I say what always comes out in Wick's theorem is the psi bar, so if I have some loop here with all sorts of lines depending from it, and this is one and this is two, I always get the normal ordered product in this order. No, that's the result. That, but then you've got to find out what minus sign that gives you or plus sign or whatever. In the states, you have to tell me what convention you have for the sign of your states. P1, P2 is not P2, P1, or two Fermi states. I will give specific examples. If you, if you are not too puzzled, perhaps you should postpone that question for 15 minutes and then if, see if you still have it after the example. Mm -hmm. yeah. Once you get the knack of it, these rules are not at all uh, difficult to um, work out. Let me just return to the process uh, I use as a prototype, which is um, meson nucleon scattering, and now write down both diagrams that contribute to lowest order and actually compute what they are. P, Q, P prime, Q prime, P, P prime, Q, Q prime. Uh, and I have to specify the spinners. Instead of saying R and S, I'll just say this has some spinner U, some linear combination of U1 and U2 associated with it. This has U prime, this has U, and this has U prime. The internal momenta are fixed by energy momentum conservation. Here it is P plus Q running along the arrow. 
And here running along the arrow, it is p prime minus q, what it has to be before q comes in to make p prime. So I've I have to fix both the internal momenta oriented along the arrow. I have to write a definite theory, so I will take the theory in which gamma equals I gamma 5. I'll now write down the invariant amplitudes from these two diagrams, and then people can ask me questions if they don't see where the expressions came from. There's a minus I g squared. There's a u bar. There's prime bar. There's an I gamma 5. There's a I, a I over P slash plus Q slash minus M plus I epsilon. There's an I gamma 5. And there's a U. That's the first diagram. The order of matrix multiplication is with the head of the arrow on the left, the tail of the arrow on the right, a U bar for every outgoing particle, a U for every incoming particle. <coughs> That's the first diagram. The second diagram is still the same thing. I gamma 5. I over is still oriented with the thing. P prime slash minus Q slash minus M plus I epsilon. I gamma 5. U. Close brackets. I've written it in terms of the invariant amplitude, so wise guys can't say you forgot the 2 pi fourth energy momentum <laughs> conserving delta function. And I have, um, I have no Fermi minus signs because of the psi bar psi rule. The expression I get out is psi bar psi, and psi is in the right position to annihilate the initial nucleon, and psi bar is in the right position to create the final nucleon. Any questions? I will now manipulate this object. First, I'll gather together all the eyes. I say I've got a minus one here. I've got two eyes there, which is another minus one. I've got an eye on top, which I'll cancel out. So that takes care of the eyes. I've got a g squared. I've got a u bar prime. I've got gamma 5. I'll rationalize the denominators. And I know in this kinematic region, I don't need to keep track of the i epsilons. Minus m plus m gamma 5 plus gamma 5 p slash p prime slash minus q slash plus m over p prime minus q squared minus m squared, gamma 5, and then the u. Now, I can get rid of the gamma 5s in a flash, because gamma 5 squared is 1, and gamma 5 anti-commutes with p slash and q slash. So I just drag it through. Equals g squared, u bar prime from the first term, p plus q squared minus m squared. The p slash terms change sign, minus p slash minus q slash plus m. And the gamma 5 squared disappears because it's 1. From the second term, I get plus minus p prime slash plus q slash plus m. m, of course, does not change sign when I bring a gamma 5 through it. p prime minus q squared minus m squared, and then a u. Any questions? Yes, sir. Um, should it be in the second denominator, p prime minus q minus q? No, it's p prime minus q here. Because before this accepts the incoming moment meson of momentum, after it accepts the incoming moment meson of momentum Q, it becomes P prime. So therefore, it is P prime minus Q beforehand, oriented along the line. <coughs> now, this 
expression, in fact, simplifies enormously. This is typically what happens in Feynman calculations. They are horrible with spinners. They are horrible, but not so horrible as one would think naively. <laughs> because we have P slash acting on a free particle spinner, which I remind you is appropriate to momentum P. And therefore, P slash U equals M. Likewise, on the right, P prime slash on U, prash, sla on U bar prime is also equivalent to M. So the P's cancel the M's, and we're left with G squared U bar prime Q slash U times 1 over P prime minus Q squared minus M squared plus 1 over P plus Q squared minus M squared. That was our first sample computation. As a minus sign, thank you. It's rather pleasant once you get the knack of it, rather like doing an especially simple crossword puzzle. You just <laughs> drag things around, and then you can eliminate all sorts of factors because they're hitting solutions of the free Dirac equation. As, are there questions about this example? I will now um, do a second example, I will, which uh, the Fermi minus signs will be a little bit more complicated, although the gamma algebra will be considerably simpler. And that is nucleon, nucleon scattering. P2, U1, U2, P1 prime, U1 prime, P2 prime, U2 prime. Same thing down here. I will first write down the, the expression for the amplitude without taking account of the Fermi minus factors, because I have to tell you how I'm normalizing my state, how I'm defining the sign of my state. Thus I have IA equals from the top line, well firstly, minus IG squared. From the top line, U1 uh, bar prime i gamma 5 u1, period. That's all there is to it. There's just a vertex. There are no internal propagators. From the bottom line, u2 bar prime i gamma 5 u2. From the propagator, i over p1 minus p1 prime squared minus mu squared, and again, there's no need to, inclu to uh, contain, include the i epsilon factor. From the second graph, u1 bar prime, i gamma 5, u2. I leave a blank space here. I'll put in the Fermi minus signs in a moment. u2 bar prime i gamma 5, u1, from the propagator, p1 minus p2 prime squared minus mu squared. OK, we'll worry about the Fermi minus signs in a moment. But is that part of it clear to everyone? We have matrix multiplication along each line, an independent matrix multiplication for each Fermi line going through the graph. Now. To take care of the minus signs, I have to use the magic psi bar psi rule. I 
I will call, I'll label the creation operators for my initial state simply as B1 adjoint and B2 adjoint for your, uh, just to avoid writing a lot of P's and R's and things. So uh, suppose I take my initial state to be That is, first I create the Fermi, the nucleon with quantum numbers two, and then I create the nucleon with quantum numbers one. Unless I'm going to introduce a totally artificial, artifactual minus sign into a forward scattering, my final state should be vacuum B2 prime, B1 prime, the adjoint of that equation. So if one equals two, one equals one prime and two equals two prime, the final state is indeed the same as the initial state, not minus the initial state. The, uh, I now have to work out what happens using the psi bar psi rule. I always have the operator associated with the head of the line to the left of the operator associated with the tail of the line. Therefore, the tail of the line is annihilating, let's do the first line first in the first graph. The tail of the line is annihilating B1, is annihilating particle one. The head of the line is creating particle one prime, and head goes before tail. Likewise, on the bottom line, head goes before tail. That's the psi bar psi rule, heads before tails. Okay. Which, whether I wrote these two factors in front or in back of these two factors is irrelevant. That's an overall plus sign. <clears throat> now, this is not in good position to annihilate and create these initial and final states. B1 here is in a great position to kill this, but B1 at prime adjoint is not all the way over on the left to kill this. Therefore, I rearrange it by bringing B1 prime adjoint all the way over onto the left. That requires two permutations, so it's an overall plus sign. Giant B2 prime adjoint B2 B1. Now everything is in great position. B1 can knock off B1 adjoint. B2 can then knock off B2 adjoint. B1 prime adjoint can knock off B1. B2 prime adjoint can cancel out B2 prime. So in this case, the Fermi sign is plus one. I haven't gotten any minus sign. What about the second case? It is not really as tedious as this, believe me. After you've done it two or three times, you can do it by eyeball. I'm just going through it step by step so people will, will know where these signs come from. What about the second um, case? Well, tails after heads. So here we have on one line, one being annihilated and two prime being created. On the other line, we have two being annihilated and one prime being created. Now again, I want to bring things into standard position. Well, the B1 is still in the right place. And so in this time, so is the B1 prime adjoint, but the B2 and B prime, the twos are in the wrong place. So B1 prime adjoint, B2 prime adjoint, B2, B1. With a minus sign, because I've had to make one permutation. And therefore, in this case, I have a minus one. 
In this case, we could not have guessed unless we were extraordinarily clever. Extraordinarily clever means cleverer than I was last night when I was writing this lecture. Unless one is extraordinarily clever, one could not have guessed the absolute sign of either of these two terms. However, one could easily guess that the relative sign had to be minus 1 because this, the statement that the relative sign is minus 1 is simply the statement that if one interchanges 1 and all the 1 labels and all the 2 labels, the total amplitude is odd which is, of course, what we would expect for a scattering process involving Fermi particles. This is frequently a useful rule. Sometimes you don't have to work out the absolute sign. If so, all you're going to do is square the amplitude at the end of the computation anyway. And frequently, Fermi statistics is good enough to tell you the relative sign between the various graphs. Sometimes not. It doesn't work, for example, in meson meson into nucleon antinucleon. But sometimes, sometimes it's enough. No. That's right, doesn't work there. Are there any questions about these? Um, these procedures? There was a gentleman who had a question earlier that he did not understand the psi bar psi rule. Do you now understand the psi bar psi rule? or else you've been beaten into the ground. You don't care. <laughs> That's the technique we use. It's modeled after the Russian secret police. After an hour and 15 minutes of this kind of lecturing, you'll admit you understand anything. <laughs> <laughs> fast, confess, you understand Fermi statistics. I understand, I understand. Trotsky and I understood it together in 1918. <laughs> Churchill explained it to us in a secret meeting. Now, <laughs> the next, the next, Mm, yes. <laughs> Such always happens to enemies of true science. Now, <laughs> um, I have explained uh, all there is to explain about uh, actual compu computation of S matrix elements between uh, particles in definite spin states. And indeed, if you are interested in some particular definite spin state, say a state of definite helicity for the initial fermion, a state of definite helicity for the final fermions, what you've got to do at this stage is then to evaluate the numbers, plug in the appropriate u's and u bars for the initial and final particles, and evaluate the matrix element. However, there is a large class of experiments in which one uh, is either uninterested in or does not is unable to measure the spin of the initial or final states. One frequently does experiments with unpolarized beams of particles, and one frequently does experiments like bubble chamber experiments in which it is difficult to measure the spin of the final proton. And therefore, one is frequently interested in cross sections, which are either summed over final spins, since you don't care what final, your apparatus responds whatever the final spin is, or averaged over initial spins, because you have a statistical distribution of initial spins in the incoming beam. So I will have to I append to this lecture an appendix Mind you, the proper procedure, unless you want to make mistakes of a factor of one half, is that you always average over an initial spin, since you know how many particles are coming in. You just don't know what their spin is. And you always sum over a final spin, since you don't, your apparatus responds whether the final particle is spinning up or spinning down. As a specific example, let me take meson nucleon scattering. in which we showed that the ampl scattering amplitude was some function 
of center of mass energy and scattering angle, for, for example, times, which I won't bother to write down again, you have it written down, times u bar prime q slash u. I hope you remember that. <laughs> now, the, uh, we want to uh, take this thing, we want to compute a squared, say between a definite polarization state R and a final one S. So I'll make this S, R, and I'll remind you that this has momentum P, and this has momentum P prime. What we want to do is sum on R and S ASR squared and divide by one half because we are averaging over the initial spins, which are two in number, and summing over the final spins. This is equal to F squared, that won't be affected by the spin sum, sum on R and S, um, U bar S of P prime, Q slash, U R of P times this complex conjugate, which is U bar R of P, Q slash, U S of P prime, Q slash being self bar. Now we may use a cunning idea due to Feynman, who saved generations of physicists from having to compute 16 uh, four matrix elements with explicit spinners and some like they used to do when they were doing this sort of computation in the 1930s. He observed that a number can be thought of by as a one by one matrix and that a one by one matrix is equal to its trace. <laughs> <laughs> now, the trace is invariant under cyclic permutation of factors. So therefore, I can write this as F squared trace sum of R and S, bringing this factor over from the beginning to the end, US P prime, U bar S P prime, Q slash, U R of P, U bar R of P, Q slash, yes, did I drop the one half? Okay, this is now a trace of a four by four matrix, but it's the same as the trace of the original one by one matrix. Because it's cyclically invariant, and of course it is set up so we can use a little wonder completeness relations. <laughs> and write this as one half F squared trace P prime slash plus M Q slash P slash plus M Q slash. Are there any questions about this operation? Certainly. I'm sorry, I shouldn't have run that low on the board. Any questions? Now, this is, uh, this is the redemption of the last homework problem set where you might have wondered why you were working out all those dumb trace identities. As you recall, <coughs> The trace of an odd number of gamma matrices always vanishes. The uh, trace of, uh, well, we won't even have to compute the trace of two. The trace of four is given by an identity. Trace A slash B slash C slash D slash is four. A dot B, C dot D, minus A dot C, B dot D, uh, D plus A dot D, B dot C. That is, you'll remember it if you did the homework problem right. <laughs> okay, so we're all set up for doing things. We can have one half F squared. All our trace formulas will have a four in them, so I'll drag that out in the beginning. 
the trace of m squared, a number, times q slash times q slash, which is q squared, and the trace of 1 is 4. That's the terms with the explicit m's in them. Now, the other terms are <coughs> plus p prime q p q. Therefore, I have p prime dot q p dot q minus p prime dot p q squared plus p prime dot q p dot q. This can be simplified somewhat. Q squared is, of course, on the mass shell and therefore equal to mu squared. So this is m squared mu squared minus p prime dot p mu squared plus 2 p prime dot q p dot q. No prime. I'm sorry, I'm running into fossilized equations. Which, by trivial kinematic exercises that I shall not bother to go through, can be reduced to um, uh, functions, of course, of the only real two invariants, the center of mass energy and the center of mass scattering angle. Okay. This is, yes, sir? Well, you'd have to tell me what the spin state, there's no, no, no number, there's no answer until there's a question. You've got to tell me what the spin state of the initial, of the... I mean, uh, suppose we're given the uh, spin right out the You just write out the matrix and find out what Q slash is, that's the most naive way. It is possible, I wasn't planning to lecture on it, but you will find in Bjorkane and Drell, you can also write down projection operators for particular helicity states. That is not summing over all R, but just summing over R's with a given helicity. Okay? As I don't, rec I think they have gamma fives in them, although I'm not sure. But you can work them out. No, that's for the massless case. That doesn't work for a particle at rest. Uh, but <clears throat> one can, if you, there are, you can find the literature. I'm sorry, I don't, I don't recall what they are. The projection operators for particular helicity states, for example. So if you're not interested in the phase of the matrix element, you can play the same sort of trick with those somewhat more complicated objects replacing p slash plus m and p slash minus m. And again, avoid the agony of writing down a particular solution to the Dirac equation. Another device that's frequently used is to um, reduce things to two component spinners by writing a general solution of the Dirac equation, u sub p, as e to the alpha dot e phi over 2. capital U zero, where capital U is a two-component spinner. Okay, that was as the formula we used for boosting up both E1 and E2. Okay. Then you have reduced, you have expressed everything in terms of two-component spinners, and by using the using Dirac algebra and the block form of the Dirac matrices and standard representation, it is fairly easy to reduce this to a form that looks much more like a non-relativistic expression involving either u adjoint u or u adjoint sigma dot u times various factors of momentum. Okay? And then frequently you can find the information you want from that without going further. Of course, if I read this under rotate, this is a mapping that is uh, not Lorentz invariant, but is rotationally invariant. If I rotate this state, the effect is just to rotate this two component spinner in the standard way. Okay, so you can make it look like standard formulas that way. And there's a whole lore. You can even find rules for dragging out the actual helicity amplitudes. I just didn't think it was worthwhile developing them here. Okay, are there other questions? Well, I ran through it early. Next time, despite my announcement, um, next time I will give you a gigantic homework problem set where you do this start of stuff all the way through from beginning to end for a few scattering processes. and. Uh, I will um, 
lecture next time, I won't go to renormalization next time because I have not discussed yet something I discussed in the similar uh, discussion for the spinless case. I've not yet discussed uh, charge conjugation and time reversal, or TCP. And now that we have our general formalism on board, we can discuss charge conjugation, time reversal, and TCP. So I will do that next lecture, and then at the end of next lecture, get on to renormalization. <laughs>